The United States after the American Civil War entered a period known as Reconstruction. Every state that was a part of the Confederacy was occupied by Union troops as they prepared to be readmitted into the Union. Basically, each state had to ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that banned slavery, gave black people citizenship, and gave black men the right to vote. You can imagine the people who literally took up arms to prevent this sort of thing wouldn't be likely to enforce those new rules, so Union troops were there to make sure it happened. This led to a short period where African Americans were able to vote without too much trouble and even win political office. One example of Union troops helping was basically destroying the first iteration of the racist terrorist group the Ku Klux Klan by 1872. But as each state dealt with their post-war rebuilding, Virginia in the late 19th century experienced one of the most unexpected political movements thanks to a group of people known as the Readjusters. The Readjusters managed to unite not only Democrats and Republicans, but even many ex-Confederates and former slaves which seemed impossible when the Civil War had only ended a few decades ago. But to better understand who they were and how they accomplished such a feat, we need to understand what politics were like in Virginia in the late 19th century. Political parties evolve over time, and back then they weren't as ideologically solid as they were now. In addition, there were regional differences and multiple wings in both the Democrat and Republican parties. Republicans originally coalitioned around being anti-slavery, but with the Civil War over, Republicans began to have a few factions that focused on different things. By the late 1870s, there were three groups of Republicans. Stalwarts were Republicans whose main focus was ensuring rights for African Americans and, to a lesser extent, protectionism with tariffs. They also controversially supported political machines and the spoil system, believing that you should win at any cost and once you win, you should give it all to your supporters. Then you had a group who cared about African American rights but were notably against the political machines and the spoil system because they believed that such things perhaps, maybe, just a little bit corrupted politicians sometimes. So they tended to push for civil service reform. Thus the stalwarts nicknamed them half-breeds because they thought that they were only half-Republican. The final group wasn't an organized faction so much as a group of voters who usually voted Republican but could easily be persuaded to vote Democrat if the Republicans appeared too corrupt or radical, and these were nicknamed Mugwumps. For Democrats, we had two main groups. The Northern Democrats from before the Civil War became what people called the Bourbon Democrats, a faction that was focused on fiscal conservatism and classical liberalism for economics. The name Bourbon Democrats was more derisive as bourbon was seen as an old-fashioned drink at the time, so they basically saw these Democrats as just old-fashioned politicians. The Southern Democrats from before the Civil War kept their white supremacy views, but instead of supporting slavery, they were now known as the Redeemers, focused on resisting every measure of Reconstruction and demonized not only freed slaves, but anyone who dared support Northern reforms, which were called scallywags. They also hated people that were known as carpetbaggers, a term that referred to people who opportunistically moved from one state to another to take advantage for their careers. With so many freed slaves, many people from the North moved to the southern states to educate or do business with them, since a lot of people in the South refused to do so or were economically not able to do so due to being destroyed by the war. The Redeemers villainized them and the scallywags for supporting black people which they believed was ruining their society. With all these factions in mind, Virginia, despite being a southern state, was close enough to the north that you could find sizable populations of all these factions living there. This made it easier for a potential third party to arise. Before the Readjusters, a third party arose that was a coalition of moderate Republicans and a group of Democrats who believed the South needed to repent for their sins of slavery by supporting freed slaves as fellow citizens. These two groups formed the Conservative Party of Virginia and won a majority of the state's legislature in 1869. Their support of repentance helped Virginia fulfill its Reconstruction requirements and be fully readmitted into the Union in 1870. The Conservative Party, once Virginia was readmitted into the Union, then had a plan to build a public school system for Virginia. A lot of the South was basically humiliated by their defeat in the Civil War, and many wanted to rebuild their state so they could get their dignity back and improve their situation. A public school system would be a great step in that direction, but they ran into a problem. Once Virginia was back in the Union, they reacquired their pre-war debt, and with interest. It didn't help that many Northern bankers had moved to Virginia and weren't interested in canceling those debts. 
This not only added fuel to anti-carpet-bagging feelings in Virginia, but also began a split of the Virginia Conservative Party. They had a choice. Focus on building the school system first, or focus on paying off this debt first. And this is when the readjusters come into play. In 1877, two former Confederate officers, Lt. Harrison Riddleberger and Gen. William Mahone, formed the Readjuster Party. Riddleberger went through the final year of the Civil War in a prison camp, which gave him a chance to reflect and also develop an interest in both the law and the press. After the war, he opened a legal practice and founded the Shenandoah Democrat newspaper, and later, The Virginian. William Mahone, meanwhile, served under Robert E. Lee, and after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee requested that his subordinate generals re-enter public life rebuilding Virginia, which Mahone saw as a duty. Mahone began investing in railroads, but went nearly bankrupt with the Panic of 1873. These two men understood the desire of many ex-Confederates to reacquire their dignity and economic standing, as well as the importance of rebuilding Virginia. They saw the Civil War as something that happened, but it needed to be moved on from. So their new readjuster party were adamant about founding these public schools first, and their plan to be able to focus on them was to readjust the debt. Now, what does that mean? Well, they brought up that the state of West Virginia had seceded from Virginia in 1863, and a lot of their pre-war debt came from efforts to develop the areas that became West Virginia. Since West Virginia is the one using those investments, they should readjust the debt to reflect that it's actually West Virginia's debt, not theirs. In other words, they wanted to take the debt and push it somewhere else in West Virginia. This appealed to poor whites in Virginia because odds were they were on average going to be way more crippled by debt than their rich counterparts. It's also important to remember that slavery was more often than not something the rich planter aristocracy of the South participated in, not the poor. So in their eyes, even if they didn't like black people, it was the richest fault that Virginia was in this mess. So aside from the ex-Confederates who wanted these public schools, you also had a large amount of poor whites supporting readjusters as well. But despite this large amount of support, the Virginian legislatures were divided between Democrats, Republicans, and the conservatives. The conservatives, who didn't approve of the readjuster plan, ended up folding back into the Democratic Party. This meant that the only way the readjusters could hope to win was to align themselves with the Republicans. As a result, the readjusters began to appeal to the African American population. Want to move past the Civil War? That means we all work together as Virginians and rebuild, black and white. If this sounds shockingly progressive for the 19th century South, it was, and many people were outraged by such a thought. But many poor ex-Confederates were willing to suck it up for the time being. In 1879, the readjusters won a majority in the Virginia Assembly, and then they increased that majority in 1881. Then in the 1881 election for Virginia governor, the readjusters ran William Cameron, who won with just under 53% of the vote. Mahone and Riddleberger, meanwhile, got elected to the U.S. Congress as senators in 1881 and 1883, respectively. All of these victories allowed the readjusters to get a lot of stuff done. In 1882, the readjusters managed to negotiate a way to transfer one-third of their pre-war debt to West Virginia. While West Virginia objected, Virginia just ran with it. The debt was no longer their problem, at least not as much. They also reorganized taxes to relieve poor farmers and small businesses while ensuring enforcement of taxes among the more wealthy. They also got rid of a poll tax, which, while it was implemented to restrict many blacks from voting, it also happened to affect a lot of poor whites as well. To further keep their African-American support, they not only invested in public schools, but built Virginia Tech, a notable black university. They also banned public whipping as a legal punishment for crimes. Meanwhile, in the city of Danville, they elected a majority black city council and even had an unprecedentedly integrated police force. But unfortunately, this would cause a backlash. With the debt and school issue finally settled, and the unprecedented level of integration in civic service, you had simultaneously fewer reasons for ex-Confederates to support the readjusters, and then also a rise of white supremacist violence. On November 3rd, 1883, a shooting broke out between white supremacists and some African Americans in Danville, which resulted in five deaths, four of them being black. This happened to be three days before the next Virginian local elections, and it inspired a wave of violence in the Danville area in the form of beatings and additional murders against the black populace across the next three days. 
After the initial day of violence, this statement was ran in the Richmond Dispatch. These Negroes had evidently come to regard themselves as in some sort the rightful rulers of the town. They have been taught a lesson, a dear lesson it is true, but nevertheless a lesson which will not be lost upon them, nor upon their race elsewhere in Virginia. Unfortunately, we don't know how many died after the initial shooting, and the rest of Virginia joined in the backlash by voting the readjusters out of power in the 1883 elections. The readjusters were also unable to win the next gubernatorial election in 1885. White supremacists winning back power officially blamed the black population of Danville for their own massacre, despite a federal investigation reaching the obvious opposite conclusion. Mahone and Riddleberger continued serving as senators until 1887 and 89 respectively, but were also unable to win re-election. Riddleberger would die in 1890, and Mahone tried to stay active in Virginia politics until his own death from a stroke in 1895. His death ended the readjusters altogether. Unfortunately, starting from the turn of the century, Virginia joined the rest of the South in implementing dozens of discrimination laws against the African American population, and adding them to a new state constitution in 1901. Thus, Virginia began their Jim Crow era, and the temporary progressivism of the readjusters just now a brief memory. Ironically, the final legacy of the readjusters would be a Supreme Court case over their readjustment of the debt to West Virginia. In the 1911 case Virginia v. West Virginia, the Supreme Court upheld Virginia's side, and in 1915 West Virginia was given an agreed-upon debt of $12.4 million that would eventually be paid off in 1939. While the readjusters were a short part of Virginian history, it serves as a reminder that there were many examples of temporary success and advancement of the rights of the freed black population in the South during Reconstruction and even in some cases a few years after it ended. The era of Jim Crow and segregation in many ways was a backlash against that success. While people optimistically view progress as a steady march forward, there was actually a lot of stumbling and setbacks along the way. And unfortunately, even today we haven't found a way to avoid similar backlashes. But unlike before, we can be better prepared to resist backlashes by learning from our history. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.